countries. And after arriving, President Barrow spoke to the waiting media about his visit to Nigeria. Purposely, the visit is just to go and update uh, President Buhari. Gambia, we are in a transition, and now it's almost four years. And they are our partners in the transition. And Nigeria have been very, very supportive. Personally, Buhari have been very, very supportive to the Gambia. I deem it fit to go there and update him the state of affairs in the Gambia. Basically, it was all about that. And also, we talk about our bilateral relationship, how to strengthen our relationship. We were there supporting in different areas justice, judiciary, education. The trip is very, very positive. I was there with my Minister of Justice. We needed more technical support. Uh, he engaged in a bilateral discussion with the Minister of Justice. The message was very, very clear. Send us a request, we're going to help you. It was very, very clear, very direct. Buhari himself, he assured us that he is going to support Gambia and he's going to support this transition period. They want Gambia to succeed. To him, definitely he is satisfied with what I told him and he is ready to work with us in the future to make sure we succeed as far as our transition is concerned. Nigeria and the Gambia had a long-standing relation and the two presidents have been working very closely to consolidate the already existing cordial ties between Banjul and Abuja. Nigeria have been very supportive to the Gambia's democratization process, playing a pivotal role in various aspects of the country's transition process. Momodes Jalo, GRS News, at the Banjul International. Because the panel of five judges of the Supreme Court, led by Chief Justice Hassan B. Jalo, on Friday set aside an unspecified date to deliver judgment on the constitutional immunity claim by the embattled former junta member and one-time minister Yanko Vaturi. The panel of Apex Court made the unanimous decision after both the state defense and a human rights group lawyers who appeared as friends of the court filed and adopted their briefs of arguments for consideration. The decision by the Constitutional Court will determine whether Mr. Yanko Bature is immune from prosecution or not based on the 1997 Constitution and his portfolio as a former member of the AFPRC. The accused Yanko Bature was a former junta member and one-time minister of the defunct military council, which overthrew the democratically elected regime of the late President Jawara in July 1994. Mr. Ture is being tried on a murder charge for his alleged participation in the murder of Usman Koro Sise, former junta finance minister, who mysteriously died in June 1995 at the residence of Mr. Ture in Kololi. His arrest and prosecution came following his refusal to testify before the Truth Commission in June 2019 to explain the circumstances that led to the killing of his late cabinet colleague and one-time minister, Usman Koro Sise. Mr. Ture, however, denied any wrongdoing, and since then he is being detained at the state central prison at Mile 2. In trying to establish prima facie case, the state prosecutors presented nine witnesses before declaring the closure of their case, while the defense called three witnesses, including the accused himself. When Mr. Today initially appeared before the Truth Commission in June last year to explain the circumstances surrounding the death of the late junta minister, Usman Koro Sise, who raised the issue of constitutional immunity and refused to testify, prompting the state prosecutors to charge him with murder. Moving on, the Minister of Finance and Economic Affairs on Friday presented the 2021 Appropriation Bill before the deputies at the National Assembly. The document outlined several sectors undertaken during the year and also highlighted the decrease in economic growth due to the coronavirus pandemic. Ominjai reports a bill that is sent to be debated on by parliamentarians later on Monday. The finance minister finally fulfills his constitutional mandate on budget delivery tabling the appropriation bill before deputies at the National Assembly. His statement outlined several hindrances to domestic growth which slowed down the economy, citing the global pandemic as the main cause of fiscal retardation. The finance minister's statement also highlighted major fiscal developments detailing sectoral activities 
during the period under review. The 2020 fiscal year saw huge challenges, especially during the surge and the first wave of COVID-19. Minister Njai further explained the rationale behind the slow growth of the Gambia's GDP, which was particularly affected by problems faced in the tourism sector, which took the hardest hit from the pandemic with travel restrictions and a drastic drop in demand and services cutting revenue. COVID-19 has severely crippled the tourism sector and dampened economic activities throughout the country. The tourism sector immediately felt the shock of the virus when it was declared a global pandemic, even before a single case was registered in the country. From April to October, the Gambia was in a declared state of emergency with a number of restrictive measures put in place, including the closure of scale down or scale down of businesses, schools, markets, restaurants and nightclubs. The first wave of the virus totally shut down the economy, affecting several sectors that might only begin to experience growth next year. Real GDP growth is projected to decline significantly from 6.1% in 2019 to negative 1.5% in 2020. This is on account of a contraction growth in the service sector emanating mostly from the wholesale, retail trade and tourism subsector. The pandemic also impacted national development with shortfalls derailing the execution of the budget, forcing government to restructure and reprioritize expenditures that came as a result of COVID-19. The reprioritization of the NDP will be finalized by end March 2021 and the process of formulating a new medium-term development plan will be initiated in the third quarter of 2021. The evaluation of Vision 2020 has been concluded. This evaluation will help guide the formulation process of Vision 2020. 20 successor. A raft of reforms are being rolled out towards the coming year to save the country's finance sector, but Minister Njai said these will only begin to take effect in January 2021. With effect from January 2021, payments of salaries and pensions would be made electronically. Civil servants and pensioners would be required to indicate their mode of payment, such as direct payments through commercial banks microfinance institution or mobile money operators. The implementation of the government treasury single account is in progress. The communication sector is expected to see a major boost in 2021 to facilitate the movement of the state broadcaster from analog to digital operations. A partnership has been signed with Digital Gambia Limited and ESCA for the implementation of a digital terrestrial transformation transmission project which will allow GRTS switch from analog to digital broadcasting nationwide, thereby ensuring distribution of quality services. With major growth forecasted for 2021, partner support grants are expected to effectually increase from 7.3 billion to 12 billion while gross expenditure is expected to increase from 25.6 billion to 31.9. New revenue measures are additionally targeted to effect from January 2021 with increased tariffs on tobacco products in the Gambia. While the country anticipates a promising fiscal turn next year, the finance minister's marathon deliberation outlined several bright spots that could boost growth in 2021. On Monday, deputies will debate the 2021 appropriation bill at the assembly chambers where they will deliver their insight on the document. Omin Jai, GRTS. We will continue with parliamentary matters because lawmakers have been reacting to the 2021 appropriation bill after the document was tabled before them. Afatu Elika Mulushi sounded the thoughts of some lawmakers and other government officials, and this is her report. Projected spending, government's fiscal policy, and programs for the year 2021. The finance minister gave an exhaustive deliberation on planned programs and key developments envisioned for 2021. 
A contrast of the fiscal outlook of preceding years shows the far-reaching effects of the global pandemic on the country's economy. COVID-19 also caused significant spikes in expenditure and slow revenue input, signaling a critical period ahead for economic recovery as a whole. The country witnessed a negative decline of growth that has not been experienced in nine years. Those grim outcomes has led to new priorities, focusing on boosting the service sector and agriculture towards a projected rebound of 5.9% in 2021. In 2021, we said the leading sector is agriculture. And so far, what we have is a bumper harvest. And that alone, we said the tourism and agriculture, they are the growth drivers. But what tourism is really very down, but agriculture, thank God that we've been able to have a bumper harvest. Yes, we've lost revenue, but we have also been able to come up with very stringent policies in terms of expenditure control, and that has given us a lot. We have not been borrowing. That is why right now in the market there is a lot of liquidity. Our fiscal discipline remains strong, intact, and that's the momentum we want to continue. The country lost about $2 billion in 2019 as cost incurred in the purchase of medical equipment in building resilience against the COVID-19 pandemic. Recovery will require the implementation of tax regulation mechanisms to mitigate the ever-growing budget deficit, which now stands at $9.6 billion, compared to previous figures of $6 billion. And uh, he indicated that from now on, effective 1st of January, all those uh, who requested for the duty waiver and other tax exemption has to be endorsed by Minister of Finance. And if you look at the uh, figures that he quoted, uh, we normally lose a lot of revenue due to uh, this tax exemption ranging from duty waiver and other exemptions. So I believe that if that area is uh, taken care of, it's going to give us a lot of savings. And um, as a, a tax advisor to the minister, I think I am very happy that he mentioned that and it is uh, categorically spelled out in the budget speech. Yeah. The new tax reforms could affect a number of products, including tobacco which will be revalued with an increased rate that could see a pack of cigarettes previously costing $25 hitting $30 by January 1, 2021. Inflation has not made a significant change, as highlighted by the minister, who indicated that a number of sectors are accorded just enough to sustain salaries and will not gain additional allocation for other budgetary purposes or programs. Nance hailed the minister and his team for putting great efforts into the budget design after the Finance Committee advised cutbacks in the total budget estimate. I am impressed because uh, prior to the finalization of the budget, uh, the National Assembly members really had two weeks to go through it. Uh, if you look at the initial budget that was presented and the final copy now, there's a huge difference. The members were able to cut down the deficit for, by two, million, two billion. And uh, a lot of money had been transferred from one section to the other. For example, the uh, agri sector and the uh, health sector. These are sectors that are really important. First of all, many people will talk to you about the productive sectors of the, of the, of the economy. That is where we need to you know, pump most of these resources. And I fully agree with them. I mean, there was a time I said, OK, I mean, we have been pumping money on the productive sector of the country. And equally, my stand is also to pump more money on the youth sector as well, because I believe that I mean, putting more money on the youth sector will also you know, generate a lot of impact for this country. NAMS are now poised for a major appropriation bill debate in the coming days. They will be joined by the minister, who is expected to return to the assembly to take on their questions as the review continues. You cannot predict uh, parliament uh, and parliamentarians. Uh, we will start debates on the, the budget on Monday. And sure, I'm expecting a tough debate on it. Like I said, there is no perfect uh, budget. The minister has set forth priorities in infrastructure, agriculture, tourism, amongst all the service sectors. But the Gambia continues to battle debt distress. Minister Njai has made clear that the country's path to economic recovery will be strengthened by viable debt sustainability mechanisms and a strong macroeconomic environment. The NDP is a strategic tool to sustain and revitalize development efforts for the coming years that will demand concerted efforts from all sectors and departments as highlighted by the Finance and Economic Affairs Minister. Reporting for Jatis News, I am Fatou Ali Kamlushi.
Meanwhile, a two-day capacity building forum on case management for social workers organized by the Minister of Women, Children and Social Welfare on Thursday came to a close. Sena Bujam was there and she engaged some of the participants on the outcomes of the information sharing platform. The of Women's Children and Social Welfare wraps up a two-day case management training rolled out as part of activities marking 16 days of activism against sexual and gender-based violence. Women's advocates spent an engaging week expanding programs designed to raise capacity and awareness in the crusade to end sexual violence. Here, the Director of Children's Affairs, Bintu HK Fati, tells GRTS the core aims of the workshop. We organized this together with the, uh, the social welfare unit to give uh, training to social workers in giving psychosocial support on gender-based, to victims of gender-based violence. And most of the time, they are the ones uh, who touch base with uh, uh, survivors at the community level. So this is to enhance their capacity towards case management, to ensure that uh, we employ a victim-centered approach towards case management so that they will be capacitized and have a knowledge on how to do case a proper case management that is uh, victim-centered, that is survivor-centered. Meeting the outcome of the capacity workshop required, the engagements of participants involved in social work from different areas. Participants were taken through vital lessons to increase their knowledge on the handling of sensitive matters and GBV case management. Ole Ju, social worker at the Department of Social Welfare, delves into the importance of the capacity training scheme. This training is very important in, in, in the work we do as social workers because um, we have people come to us every day. You understand, you know, people go through a lot and we know GBV, it's, uh, it's, it's a big issue in, in, in our country. You understand, it happens everywhere. You know, it happens in the community, it happens in school, in our workplaces. So. Um, we are social workers, uh, we are there, you know, to um, help these victims, you know, provide psychosocial support to them, you know, uh, most especially children and women. Yeah, so, um, it, you know, I've learned a lot from it uh, because yesterday we went through um, what GBV is, um, the consequences of uh, gender-based violence. Social workers Kadi Koli from the Bidkama Regional Office and the Bakwater Shelter for Children's, Mariama C., share their experience from the workshop and ways it will benefit their work. Two days training is very important for we the social workers because working with the victim of gender-based violence, sometimes when they do come to our office, sometimes you will not even know how to handle cases eh, sometimes. But with this training, it will able to help us the type of gender-based violence women, girls and children are going through. And also how to help them to cope with the situation, to make them understand that they are not the only one going through it. There are a lot of people going through gender-based violence. Now is the time for us to wake up and stop it. We have to stop this Maslaha syndrome and work together as one and fight gender-based violence. Though it's not easy in working with uh, gender-based violence uh, survivors, it's not easy at all, but we as social workers, we do make sure, we ensure that we give them psychosocial support in, in both male and females because the issue of gender-based violence is very wide. It, it does not only concern men, women or, men, or girls, but it also involves boys also, which the society is not talking about. And gender-based violence... This, in, this training is very important in capacity building because us as social workers, we are advocates and we will hopefully go out to disseminate this information or the knowledge gained here. With scores of activities going to mark 16 days of activism against GBV, this capacity building workshop will go a long way in enhancing the impact of social workers, supporting women in our communities in effective case management. Sainu Bujang for GRTS News. The National Environment Agency on Thursday convened a day-long validation meeting for criteria of municipal solid waste and effluent discharge site selection guidelines in Carnifin. The forum brought together representatives from physical planning, public utilities authorities, councillors and regional environment officers to discuss means of addressing waste management. We have details in this report by Usman Mani. 
the management, protection, and promotion of the country's environment and natural resources is the sole responsibility of the National Environment Agency through an act of the National Assembly. With compounded growing development issues, waste management continues to put pressure on the NEA and local government authorities due to the growing population. Waste collection and disposal is the most expensive part of you know, waste management because you know, the, lo the, the, the longer the distance you know, for the final disposal, the more expensive it becomes. And uh, we've seen that you know, with population increase, urbanization and uh, increase in population, waste that is generated you know, gets overwhelming and uh, it's difficult for councils to actually manage. Currently, there are three major disposal sites for solid waste and one for effluent services. These sites can no longer meet the demands of people, which inform the NEA to bring stakeholders to validate the criteria for municipal waste and effluent discharge site selection guidelines. The, the tanker trucks that normally collect this sewage, you know, will collect it from the regions and bring it to uh, Koto. And uh, for, for Basse, uh, they were able to identify a site that was used by MRC and also uh, the locals where they dump this thing. In fact, I, I've been there, but it's not, it has not go undergone any screening process for, for, for suitability. So right now with this, you know, documents, we would go around again to identify, you know, dump sites for, for the municipal waste and also uh, uh, this uh, effluence from, from, from our, our septic tanks and soccer waste. Program officer at the NEA Bubasi explained that the document went through technical study and with the validation it will help in addressing indiscriminate dumping of waste in communities. This he noted is against the NEMA Act 1994. The CEO Janjambure Area Council Sambali underscored the importance of the validation meeting. We had a problem simply because we have some horse carts with donkey carts which used to collect this weeds and if they collect it they put it they just waste, uh, go and dump it anywhere they like. This is what brought us here today, so that we can discuss every dump site, every place will have its own dump site, and it will be put into that dump site, and the councils will be responsible. Effluent services consume much of councils' finances due to lack of suitable disposal sites in the regions. Mohamed Jabang noted the strain puts on officials. Tambana is no longer suitable because no, Navek has you know, sung a lot of uh, 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 boreholes around Tamana, and, uh, which is dangerous because the, the waste can leach and uh, contaminate underground water. And uh, if we have boreholes around that end, it's not safe for us to actually drink from those, those boreholes. So that makes Tambana unfit for, for, uh, as a dump site as at the moment. The document will now serve as a guideline for the NEA and councils to identify and select waste disposal sites to create an environment free of pollution and other health hazards. Usman Mane, GRTS. United Senior Secondary School has received a consignment of 22,000 books and solar lamps courtesy of a million books for Africa projects in a move designed to promote the culture of reading and improve learning outcomes in schools. Maud Lamisana tells us more from the Central River region. Conceptualized some 13 years ago with the view to enhancing reading in African schools, a million books for Africa organization has refocused attention on the Gambia, providing books to schools across the country. Their latest intervention at the Amite Senior Secondary School saw the organization present 22,000 books and 50 solar lamps to the school to boost their library for effective learning. This is the first time we are doing that. Paying and transportation, Amite is the only school that has got that since we started 13 years ago. Amitage is not only meant for people living in the town or in, the, in this island. Amitage, the students here present come from all over the country. So if we help Amitage, we, ha we are helping the entire country. The main objective of the organization in this crusade is to supply one million books to schools across the Gambia. 
Books for Africa are internationally recognized for the wonderful and valuable services they have been rendering to our students. Quality education cannot be attained without the availability of books, and of course, relevant books for that matter. These relevant books are the books that Books for Africa will always search for in the wider world and will package and ship to, uh, to us in Africa here, particularly in Gambia. School authorities and students greatly welcome this support program, providing vital curricular materials to expand education and teaching outcomes. Here at Amitage, before we first had supplies of these books from grade five, some time back, our library had almost been empty. However, after receiving some, some stock of these books, after placing them in our library, we had library session, reading session, compulsory, and even have library session in our individual class timetable. The books are very important to us as students. One of the most powerful weapons that a student has is the book. So if we read our books, we will make a difference. We've seen how our seniors make the school proud. So I guess if we have these books and read, we can make an exponential increase in the number of credits in English language. Because English is made up of skills. And skills cannot be part of us if we didn't practice them. And we can only practice these skills if we have the materials. And one of those materials is the books. This is among the many interventions a million books for Africa intends to distribute in the Gambia as they look forward to promote quality education in the African continent. Modula Sane reporting for GRS News from the Central River region. Now the Gambia Competition and Consumer Protection Commission on Friday organized a press briefing as part of global commemorations of World Competition Day on the theme competition policy, and access to health care. Kadija Tujuara reports. Forum joins national efforts to promote competition as an abiding practice guiding business and development. The executive secretary, GCCPC, Amadou Sise, said every year on December 5th, World Competition Day is commemorated globally for consumers and stakeholders to realize the potential and benefits of an effective implementation competition regime. The theme for this year's celebration is competition policy and access to healthcare. Access to healthcare is it's wide and it covers a lot of players. The focus today is access to healthcare, but we are focusing on access to safe medicines. Mr. Cisse noted that the Gambia Competition and Consumer Protection Commission is a stationary body established to enforce Competition Act of 2007. The Competition Act promotes and enforces fair competition in the country, enabling a level playing field for entrepreneurs and industrial investors. The Executive Director of Medicines Control Agency said the pandemic has made healthcare a top priority while commending the Competition Commission for effectively executing a competition policy in response to health crisis and health care in general. Health care is wide. We're not talking about the clinical part or the diagnostic part, but concentrating or focusing on access to safe medicines, safe quality and efficacious medicines. The principal pharmacist at the National Pharmaceutical Services, Fatou El Samate, highlighted that this year's theme is in line with global efforts to promote health and advance the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. The goal of the Directorate of Pharmaceutical Services and essentially the National Medicines Policy is to contribute to the attainment of quality health care services for the population of the Gambia through ensuring the continuous availability, accessibility, affordability of essential medicines um, that are of appropriate quality, safety and efficacy and also by promoting their rational use. Healthy competition among business entities 
has become a crucial part of industrial development, saving both access and resources needed to enhance service delivery. Reporting for GRTS News, I am Khadija Tujuara. Well, with that, we take a break now and we'll be back with news from outside the Gambia right after. Do stay. Welcome back. U.S.-China relations hit rock button under Donald Trump's presidency, despite a deal that was supposed to push their trade battles behind them. And it will be easy to think trade relations will improve under Joe Biden. While Biden is less confrontational than Trump, some experts see little difference in their actual trade policies. CGTN's Owen Faring has more in this report. Joe Biden visiting Chinese President Xi Jinping as U.S. Vice President in 2013, cultivating a warm relationship. We do not fear China's rise. We want to see China rise. The Obama administration's relationship with China was checkered, but it sunk to a new low under President Trump over trade and allegations about the origin of COVID-19 in China. And while the coronavirus has polarized Americans even more, for once, Democrats and Republicans have plenty in common when it comes to trade with China. Biden is considered less confrontational. I sought this office to restore the soul of America. But take a look at his economic program and some of the language resembles Trump's, especially claims about alleged Chinese trade abuses that triggered the president's tariffs on hundreds of billions of dollars worth of Chinese imports. Manufacturing is the backbone of America. And like Trump, Biden has a Made in America program to make the country more self-sufficient with the kind of state support that can breach global free trade laws. There is a tendency for, for all presidential candidates to get a bit nationalist. Um, so you, you'll hear the same or similar nationalist rhetoric from, from all of the candidates over time. Others think Biden's commitment to multilateral institutions and agreements will be positive for US-China trade. That is to say that would probably seek out like-minded allies to discuss um, you know, how they manage their own China relations. But that may not necessarily equate to an end to tariffs that have left US companies with steep losses, at least in the short term. If, if we're gonna see the tariffs go away, he's gonna to need to sit down with Europeans and the Canadians and the Japanese and the Australians and others and say, all right, let's work out a, a joint approach, a joint effort against China that's going to involve litigation and negotiation and just coordinated action. And yet U.S. lawmakers have other ideas about the relationship. A new bipartisan congressional report is calling for greater scrutiny of trade with China after Trump banned U.S. companies from investing in Chinese firms collaborating with the country's military. Beijing says the move is aimed at stifling legitimate competition. The Afghanistan Times newspaper welcomes China's condemnation of war crimes committed by Australian soldiers. The article comes as Australia demands an apology for a foreign ministry spokesperson tweet that included an artist's computer-generated collage. Many Afghan residents have also expressed their gratitude to China and anger at Australia. We have more in this CGTN report. All reasonable accusations. That's how many Afghan people describe Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison's demand for an apology for digital artwork depicting an Australian soldier holding a knife to the throat of an Afghan child. It is a good thing that China is condemning this inhumane act. Every Afghan wants those Australian soldiers to be brought to court. They should be taken to court for the war crimes they committed in Afghanistan. It's a good thing the Chinese government is condemning these acts. Other countries should also condemn the ugly deeds of Australian soldiers in Afghanistan. An official Australian inquiry found that 25 Australian Special Forces soldiers killed 39 Afghans, including civilians, between 2005 and 2016. Many Afghans say it's the Australian government and forces that should be apologizing to the Afghan people. They accuse Morrison of seeking to divert attention. 
I think it's a crime against humanity that the Australian Army killed 39 civilians here. I denounce this and say that the presence of the Australian military is no good for Afghanistan. After the deployment of NATO troops, the war in Afghanistan did not end. It got worse. All reasonable accusations. That's how many Afghan people describe Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison's demand for an apology. And before we end this edition of the news, a quick recap of our top, top stories once again. President Adam Abaro has come to Banjul after an official visit to the Federal Republic of Nigeria. A panel of five judges of the Supreme Court has set aside an unspecified date to deliver judgment on the constitutional immunity claim by the embattled former junta member and one-time minister Yankuba Ture. Finance Minister Mamburinjai has presented the 2021 appropriation bill before lawmakers at the National Assembly. U.S.-China relations have hit rock bottom under Donald Trump's presidency, despite a deal that was supposed to put their trade battles behind them. And China has condemned war crimes committed by Australian soldiers in Afghanistan. Well, that was all in today's edition of the news from me and the entire news team. Thanks for the pleasure of your company. Well, do stay tuned for the highlights of the appropriation, 2021 appropriation bill by the finance minister right after.